The climactic hours of the flight of Apollo 12 are at hand. Pete Conrad and Alan Bean have said a brief bye-bye to their fellow astronaut Dick Gordon and the Yankee Clipper command ship that has been their home since blasting off from Cape Kennedy last Friday. And Conrad and Bean have begun the complex series of maneuvers intended to lower their tiny lunar lander Intrepid to the moon's surface and make them the third and fourth human beings ever to set down on another world. In less than one hour, we will know whether that goal has been achieved. CBS News, color coverage, return to the moon. The flight of Apollo 12. This morning, landing on the moon by astronauts Conrad and Bean. Sponsored by Western Electric, the people who make telephones and communications equipment for the Bell System. And by the International Paper Company, where good ideas grow on trees. Reporting from the CBS News Space Center in New York, correspondent Walter Cronkite. Good morning. Well, just about 45 minutes ago, the spacecraft disappeared on the far side of the moon and lost signal with the Earth. They will recover that signal in about another three or four minutes when they come around after their 14th uh, orbit of the moon on the far side. And by that time, they should have fired their engines and uh, Pete Conrad and Alan Bean in Intrepid should have begun the descent to the moon. We'll be waiting for that acquisition of signal about three minutes from now. Meanwhile, there has been some small medical problem with the two astronauts in the landing module. And let's get the story direct from Houston. Bruce Morton is standing by there with Dr. Charles Berry, the medical director at the Manned Spacecraft Center. Bruce? Well, one of the things that uh, people have been concerned about here at uh, the Manned Spacecraft Center has been the uh, biomedical sensors that Pete Conrad is wearing. Dr. Charles Berry is here with me, the astronaut's doctor, and he spent most of the day in mission control on this problem. Uh, what are these sensors, Doctor, and why, uh, this is the third time Conrad's worn them, uh, why now does he have a problem? Well, the easiest way, Bruce, would be to probably show you these sensors. Uh, this is the sensor harness that's uh, worn by the crew, and this is uh, around the waist this way. The signal conditioners are in here, and uh, this uh, connects on to the uh, cable going to the telemetry system. These are the uh, actual sensors as they are applied to the body. And if we can untangle them all here, we'll uh, give you some idea how it goes together. We don't keep it tangled up this way normally. That's what he straps to his chest. That's and right. Sides These and so sensors uh, look like this. Uh, there's a sticky tape, which is a little tiny round tape like this, which goes on to this uh, surface. You peel this part off, and you fill this interior with some jelly like this and uh, make it even, and then you, this is uh, stuck to the chest then in a manner such as this. There's one up at the top here, uh, one at the below uh, the sternum, and then there's a, a ground one that goes out here to the right, then there's one on either side of the chest for respiration, and there's a piece of larger tape, micropore tape like this, which uh, goes over the entire uh, sensor. Why, uh, why is he now suddenly having a problem? This is uh, something well, he's done on two other flights. I wish I could answer that question, uh, Bruce, because that's the, the question of the day at the moment, because we have not changed anything in our tape uh, or in our, um, uh, the paste that we have in here. It's exactly the same. In fact, it goes clear back uh, to Scott Carpenter's flight in uh, Mercury, 
And uh, still, we have some sensitivity. Pete wore it for eight days in Gemini. What about EVA? Is there going to be a problem there? We don't expect it, uh, Bruce, because uh, Pete and uh, uh, Al are both uh, very charged up for this activity, and I think there's a difference in, in your uh, threshold of sensitivity when you're uh, just in orbit and uh, when you're actually involved in something uh, that's as demanding and as exciting as this. I think we'll have to look at it again. Uh, after the first EVA and see how they're doing at that time. Thank you very much, Dr. Walter. Thank you, Bruce and Dr. Barry. It's good, uh, good to see you again, uh, Chuck Barry in Houston. Uh, now we have just heard from uh, Houston, from the Manned Space Center, that they have established telemetry contact with the command module, the Yankee Clipper, coming around on this side of the moon for the 14th time. Uh, but uh, they have not established voice contact yet. They are attempting to do that now. And uh, uh, we are hearing over the uh, circuit from Houston the heavy static as they try to uh, get that contact. There it is. Clipper, Houston, loud and clear. This is Clipper. Houston just confirmed. Uh, hello. Roger. Dick Gordon in the uh, Yankee Clipper, the command module, said that it was a good burn, apparently. He uh, ha is, has been in communication, of course, with the lunar module on that far side of the moon when they're out of touch with the Earth. The lunar module, the Intrepid, uh, had to burn its uh, descent propulsion system engine for the first time there on the far side of the moon, out of touch with the Earth. The and of course, Houston, how do you read? Hello, Houston Intrepid. There they are. There's Roger, a we read the loud and clear, and we just watched the uh, first Earth rise, which was fantastic. Then we had a great DOI burn. The X residual was zero, Y was plus two tenths, and Z was minus six tenths. Roger, P. copy your residuals. Uh, X zero, Y plus two, point two, and Z minus point six. That's Charlie. Apparently that descent uh, orbit insertion went perfectly. Yes, Houston, uh, what were your AGS residuals, over? Roger, Houston, Intrepid, 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 that burn slowed them down by 50 miles an hour. They were at a 69 mile altitude at that time. This would drop them down. Houston, uh, we have your steerable now. Can you give us high bit rate? To just about uh, uh, Roger, going to high bit rate. 50,000 feet over the moon's surface, which would be the low point of the orbit that they are now in. That's about nine and uh, three tenths miles. At that point, at that 50,000 foot level, then they will again fire those engines to slow again and to actually begin the uh, more or less elevator descent to the moon surface. That burn is called a PDI, or Powered Descent Initiation uh, Burn. That comes now, which is, that's the next major maneuver, and it comes in uh, 33 minutes from now at 1.42 a.m. Uh, Eastern Time. And then just 13, uh, just 11 minutes later, they should be setting down on the moon's surface there on the edge of the ocean of storms on the east bank, so to speak, of the ocean of storms, 954 miles on west of where and Apollo uh, 11 landed. Uh, when uh, Emory, you're ready, we're ready to give you full data. Roger, Intrepid. As you heard them reporting there, uh, the interpretation of what they were saying in their engineering, astronaut lingo, is that uh, they had almost a perfect uh, firing of that descent propulsion engine, and uh, they are right on course for their descent to the moon. Residuals, the word they were using, refers to the error in velocity that resulted from the burn. The, those figures that are left on their computer uh, which should read down to zero uh, after they have had a burn. If there's anything left on those uh, numbers, why that's the residual number left and it shows the error. Uh, they were so small on this burn that they're virtually uh, negligible. 
So the flight of Apollo 12, now in its two stages, the command module with Dick Gordon circling overhead uh, in the Yankee Clipper, mm -hmm. the uh, lunar module, the Intrepid, uh, beginning its descent toward the moon surface for a landing uh, some uh, 51 minutes from now, 41 minutes from now. CBS News coverage of Apollo 12's descent to the moon will continue in a moment. Consider the egg, nature's perfect package. International Paper Company improves on nature with packages that protect a whole lot better. As a package, the egg has other limitations. You can't see what's inside, but you can see into some international paper packages, and you can even hang them up for sale. International Paper can put a product on a pedestal and even tell its story. And, of course, when International Paper makes packages, they come out uniform. In fact, you can say that International Paper makes a better package in every way except, perhaps, one. The International Paper Company, where good ideas grow on trees. Western Electric is making, installing, and testing a new electronic switching system for the Bell Telephone Network. It is the biggest project ever undertaken by Bell Labs and Western Electric, and it'll let your telephone do things for you it has never done before. For example, if you should leave home, you'll just dial in a code and the number where you're going. And your calls will be automatically transferred. Also, you'll be able to add three or four of your friends onto the same conversation. Hello, Dave. Bob, are you driving tomorrow? I don't think so. I think it's John's turn. Yep, it's my turn. I'll be driving. Frequently called numbers will be dialed by using two or four digits instead of the usual seven or ten. The new electronic switching system will route calls faster and more dependably than ever before. To accomplish this, Western Electric has set up a whole new manufacturing technology. The system requires electronic and solid state components, memory units to store information, and call routing devices that operate in millionths of a second. The system will even test itself and automatically point out the source of trouble if it occurs. Hello? They better not wait supper. What do you got? Kill it all? Yeah. Well, it was all Western Electric. We make Bell telephones. We're also making an electronic switching system that will be the talk of the town. Western Electric, manufacturing and supply unit of the Bell system. So right now, the men in uh, the lunar landing module Intrepid, Pete Conrad and Alan Bean, on their descent toward the moon, a landing scheduled uh, about, uh, well, let's see, it's at 53, 1.53 a.m., and it's now 1.14 a.m. Eastern Time. So within the next 45 minutes, they'll be descending toward the moon surface and actually touching down and landing there. The, uh, they are now receiving update information on their radar guidance, uh, something that was not possible uh, in the flight of Apollo 11, partly because their landing site was so much closer uh, to the eastern edge of the moon as they came around, uh, partly because it had not been figured that it would be necessary that uh, once they had their guidance set uh, for their uh, descent burn, uh, that they would go right on in. Well, the certain perturbations in the gravity of the moon caused the uh, flight to wander off just a little bit, and uh, some of the uh, things that went into the uh, moon craft itself into the lunar module and its maneuvers and correcting its position and attitude threw it off a little bit, and that forced it down, as you remember, some four miles from the target point. This time they're feeding up, up 
uh, dated information from the ground on the radar tracking and hoping to put Pete Conrad down. He wants to put it right in Pete's parking lot, he says, which is really just about a 100-foot uh, diameter circle there on the edge of the moon of storm. Let's see how he does. At any rate, they're on the way now, and we'll be uh, updating the information as we receive it from uh, Houston, from the Mission Control Center there, uh, as we go along in these next exciting minutes. Right now, with me here at our CBS News Space Center is Dr. John O'Keefe, a uh, NASA astronomer, an astronomer with our space agency. And we have with us here, it seems impossible to believe, a piece of the moon. This is one of the rocks, isn't it, Dr. O'Keefe? Yes, it that is. Brought back. Yes. What has it told us? Uh, this and the similar rocks about what the moon is made of. What have we learned from Apollo 11? Well, I think the most interesting thing that's come out of the studies of these things, out of the chemical analyses, has been the fact that these rocks are deficient in nickel and cobalt. This is somewhat the same situation that we have on the Earth. The Earth's crust as a whole is deficient in nickel and cobalt. Now, this is as compared to the sun. And the meaning of this is almost certainly that the nickel and cobalt were soaked up in the iron, which was originally mixed with the matter of the Earth's crust, and that it went down to the core of the Earth, which is almost a solid iron mass, when the core was formed. That is to say, on the Earth's crust, nickel and cobalt were leached out and went down to form the core. Now, the nickel and cobalt are missing here, too. And the, the moon doesn't have a core. So there's no possibility that it went down to a core of the moon. There's, there is some nice work that shows that the moon is almost homogeneous and doesn't have a core. And so the, the, the conclusion that seems to be obvious from this is that the moon was formed by the fission of the Earth. In other words, after the outer parts of the Earth had been leached out and had lost their nickel and cobalt, the Earth, at that time turning very rapidly, broke in two, and the moon formed as a satellite around the Earth already deprived of these elements. Does, this, uh, does anything in the study of these rocks tell you how long ago that might have happened? Yes. Uh, there are some nice analyses. Uh, Wasserberg's work, remember, shows that the whole lunar surface is some 4.5 or 4.6 billion years old, so it was earlier than that, or, or about that time. It was certainly earlier than that. Uh, we had some previous indications which made some of us hope, myself, that it would be 3.5 billion. Those were wrong. Uh, uh, four and a half billion is, is almost certainly the age. Anything like this, any, any fission of the whole Earth-Moon system, would heat the thing so badly that uh, everything would be destroyed, all structures would be destroyed, and nothing would survive from that previous time. So any dating will be since this fission event. Dr. O'Keefe, do, do, uh, do other astronomers agree with what you have just told us, uh, or is this now just one of several theories? In other words, have you answered any of the arguments or settled any of the arguments that have uh, uh, been going on ever since man first looked through a telescope practically about how the moon was formed thanks to the flight of Apollo they, 11? They, they don't agree. Uh, they, 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 there's a great deal of controversy about that. Gast is arguing the following. Am I allowed to mention people? Yeah. Paul Gast is saying this lunar sample is deficient not only in nickel and cobalt, but it is also deficient in some volatile elements, some elements which are easily heated and boiled away, and more deficient in these elements than the Earth is. And so he says it couldn't have come from the Earth. But it seems to me, uh, according to some calculations I've made, after the fission, there will be a very strong heating, and the moon actually should lose about 90% of its original mass. It should break off with a tenth of the Earth's mass and end up with about an 80th, as it has now. And that's plenty of room to, you know, produ produce this loss of volatiles. Well, now tell me, in, in, we're looking at this rock here with some beautiful crystals in it, uh, lovely reflecting surfaces and uh, all of this. It almost looks like it could be a precious uh, gem of its own. It is a precious gem, probably worth more than, uh, yes, probably even Elizabeth it. Taylor could yeah. get this one. But the... Uh, uh, the uh, uh, now 12 is on the way to the surface. Yes. And we've got, perhaps after this, eight more moon landings yes. since the funds are voted by Congress. Yes. At the end of that time, would you have settled your argument oh, with I Dr. Think Gast so. and I all the others? I think so. I think so. Part of it, of course, is a matter of just the uh, working out the discussion and so forth and so on. But part of it is involved. This came from an area which was high in titanium. Now, the surveyor analyses strongly suggest that, that the other two places where they went, 
where Surveyor went, Surveyor 6 and 7. Mm -hmm. th this is very close to Surveyor 5. Surveyor 6 and 7 were more, much poorer in titanium. So that uh, observations at several different places will give us a clue to uh, how uniformly we should apply the results that we got from, from uh, Apollo 11. I, I think it's quite likely that, for example, the very high titanium abundance here will turn out to be not typical of the moon, but just typical of that particular site. That's, at least, that's one of the things. And of course, another thing that we hope for, uh, at least I m and some of the people who think the way I do, hope for is that they'll turn out to uh, have some tectites, some of these more glassy materials. And another question that's very critical is, was the age of Mare Tranquillitatis, this thing here, four and a half billion, typical of the whole lunar surface, or are the other Maria younger? I myself think that they're younger, that these mascons and things like that indicate a, a younger age. It's mm -hmm. critical for our understanding of the inside of the moon. Uh, you see, um, this is very ancient. It also has no evidence of, an, of a load, an additional load on the lunar surface. Now, there are maria, are, you know, these seas, these lunar seas, which have evidence of, an, of a load on the lunar surface. If those maria are very ancient, they mean that the lunar surface can support a load for a very long time. And this means a fairly strong, solid material. If, on the other hand, they're ancient, uh, 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 they're more recent than this, then they mean that in the course of time, the, the lunar surface, the lunar crust, yields the way the Earth's crust does, mm -hmm. and it is soft on the inside. And this brings, comes, brings us back to the argument between Yuri and the others as to whether the moon is in its inside hot or not. Yeah. And that, that, that's the kind of thing which we, which we can certainly get at. And you're a cold moon man. No, I'm not. I you're really not. think, I suspect that these other places will turn out to be younger. And I'm, I'm rather inclined to think that, that, that the moon is hot. Partly because these tectites, you know, that uh, you've perhaps heard discussed once or twice, they have to come from a hot moon, and I'm one of the people who works on that. Tell me, when you first got a chance to look at these moons, uh, these rocks from the moon, were you surprised in any way? Did anything, did anything surprise you? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, I think that uh, I had rather hoped that we would see structures like in a welded tuff in the moon. And uh, the crystallization is more perfect, uh, not, not as you just look at them like that, but as you look at them in thin section. The crystallization is uh, more perfect than we would have expected. And this suggests uh, something which had been more thoroughly melted and more uh, allowed to crystallize out more, uh, more slowly. And also, of course, I hoped that it would be acidic. It turned out to be quite uh, uh, basaltic. However, that we were more or less prepared for from Surveyor. The astounding thing was the analysis. The astounding thing was the high titanium content. Mm -hmm. Although we really perhaps shouldn't have been astounded even by that because Turkovich had told us that we were going to have a very high titanium content. But you're, uh, you're just as excited about getting the samples back from this one as you were the first one. You, well, the more, uh, it's a fascinating. Yes, of course. Uh, the more rocks from the moon, the merrier. The, 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 the old story, you know, yeah. that the second man who does something is really more important than the first man who does it. Because when the first man says it, he's made an assertion. But when the second man does it, you can start to believe it. <laughs> well, Conrad and Bean uh, will come down with some evidence for you to start to believe. Thank you very, Thank you very much, Dr. O'Keefe, uh, NASA astronomer. We're uh, uh, waiting for more word from the uh, spacecraft as it circles the moon on this uh, last trip around as far as the uh, Intrepid goes before its landing. They are on uh, the way toward what is called the powered uh, descent initiation, which is the beginning of the intricate maneuvers which actually take them to the surface. They are now coming down on a low, slow glide to a low point of around 50,000 feet when that uh, PDI burn, as it's called, uh, comes at 1.42 uh, a.m. And uh, that's uh, around uh, 12, uh, 17, 18 minutes from now. David Schumacher standing by with our resident lunar expert, Dr. John Salisbury of the Air Force Cambridge Research Laboratories, and they can describe for you that spot on the moon toward which Apollo 12 is aiming. Walter, I guess uh, during the course of the evening, everyone should take a stand. And Dr. Salisbury tells me he's neither warm nor cold on this. He's, uh, he's a cool moon man, or I guess a warm moon, but not quite hot. Uh, Dr. Salisbury, as the Air Force scientist, who is in charge of looking at all the planets. You have spent uh, much of your career looking at the moon. What can you tell us about this particular landing site, the problems it will present for these astronauts compared to the landing site of Apollo 11? Well, that uh, 
Of course, that's a, that's a question I'd prefer you ask me an hour from now. But uh, I think we could talk to some extent to the point. Can we show the sure. model? All right. This is a model of the uh, lunar landing site for Apollo 12. Uh, this is a model of the spacecraft there, slightly exaggerated in size. This is the crater in which uh, the Surveyor 3 spacecraft is supposed to rest. Now, uh, on this model, we put some little, uh, little boulders. These are rather exaggerated, too, so that you can see them. And uh, I think we better use okay. this uh, particular Fine. pointer. <laughs> Special effects. There are boulders uh, here to show that in this area, and these boulders are taken from a U.S. Geological Survey map of the area, uh, that in this area there are craters which have large boulders surrounding them. Now, you remember we had a boulder problem uh, on the uh, uh, Apollo 11 flight. And again, we, we could have one this time, too. Uh, the, the difficulty with the photography of this area is that it does not have a resolution better than one and a half meters, which is about five feet so that there could be clusters of boulders in the area less than five feet in diameter, and we just wouldn't know it. Now, on Apollo 11, they overshot by about four miles. Uh, looking at our model, at least, it would appear as though that would be a bad idea. It begins to get pretty rocky out there, doesn't yes, it? Yes, it does. It gets rockier to the west. Uh, actually, I, uh, I think that uh, there, are enough, there are enough large boulders in this area uh, to show the pattern of uh, boulder deposition, and, and one would like to land short of the crater instead of overshooting it. Now, uh, there uh, has been quite a controversy within the space program over the selection of landing sites, disagreements between those people who like to land safely and scientists who want to get maximum payoff. Originally, there was some thought that on this mission they'd land a good deal farther to the west where it was quite a bit uh, smoother. Yes. Uh, why did they choose this location, and are you happy or unhappy about it? Well, I'm happy about it. Uh, I think this, this location was chosen primarily because it offers the possibility for sampling the composition of a wide area of the moon and determining the heterogeneity of the surface materials over a wide area. Uh, I can explain this by pointing out that uh, I try to draw a quick word picture. Uh, about 150 miles to the north is a large crater Copernicus, which is 56 miles in diameter. And it has ejected material from deep within the lunar crust in all directions and also in this direction. And so we do have, as a matter of fact, this landing site is on a ray of ejecta from Copernicus. So this gives us the possibility of picking up at this site not just local mare material from this site, but also material ejected from Copernicus 150 miles away and perhaps taken from deep within the crust. Well, so this is a, a cheap and safer way then of uh, getting some idea of uh, sampling of the, yes. of the highlands. And th this is important because uh, although the moon is considerably smaller than the Earth, it does have a surface area of 12 and a half million square miles, and we can't explore that on foot. We have to take areas that give us the maximum sample return, that is, from a large number of areas that we can pick in the same site. Thank you, Dr. Salisbury. Walter? Well, we're about 25 minutes now, 20, uh, three and a half, 24 minutes from the landing on the moon, which is scheduled a little after 1.53 a.m. Eastern time, and it's now 1.28 Eastern time. The uh, Intrepid is on its way down. It fired its uh, descent engines behind the moon on the 14th orbit uh, about 45 minutes ago, and since then, uh, since that braking maneuver, slowing it down by about 50 miles an hour, it was going around 5,700 miles an hour in its trip around the moon, uh, slowed down now so that it is coming down slowly to a point at 50,000 feet above the moon, when it will fire those engines again and then keep firing them, beginning that uh, descent right down to the surface. Nelson Benton and Scott McLeod are at the Grumman Corporation out on Long Island where they make the lunar module. And gentlemen, uh, you can tell us now what they are doing at this moment and what the piloting problems will be for this pinpoint landing thereafter. Well, Walter, it's been said all along that a pinpoint precision landing is one of the major objectives of this flight. And after going through a slightly different trajectory from the Apollo 11 trajectory, that is descending much faster to save fuel for hovering, it becomes a, a combination eyeball and computer operation. And Scott, what's the eyeball part of a pinpoint landing in the lamp? Well, Nelson, what we have here is the LPD. That's a landing point designator. Yes. <laughs> you took the words right out of my mouth. 
the landing point designator indicates by eyeball where they are going to land if they continue the same trajectory. It's a gun sight that really that uh, he lines up with a point on the surface of the moon. Mm, yes, that's correct. And the computer reads out to give them a point on this gun sight where they're going to land. If they wish to change it for some reason, they would put an input through the attitude controller to change to a new number verified by the computer for the landing site they desire. In other words, if, if landing point is under 30 and the computer says 35, they've got to make a change to make them agree. Right. And the sooner they do this, the less fuel they use. And while uh, Conrad and Bean are going through this precision landing, why Dick Gordon may be in what could be the uh, longest holding pattern in aviation his history. Leo Krupp, who's chief consulting pilot for North American Rockwell, is in the command module. Leo, uh, what will Gordon be doing while all this precision is going on? Well, uh, Dick's probably getting used to his new environment. He's going to be solo in the command module for about the next 31 hours, so he's rattling around in that big spaceship all by himself. But he is uh, keeping himself quite busy. He's attempting to continually track the, the lunar module while it's making its descent down to 50,000 feet. And uh, Dick is doing this in two ways. First of all, he's locked on with VHF ranging. And by this instrument right here on the panel, he is sending out a VHF signal to the lunar module, which is being received by the lunar module, turned around and sent back to the command module. We measure the time it takes for this signal to go out and come back. And we convert that into nautical miles. So Dick is able to look at this instrument at any time and determine the exact range uh, to the lunar module. In addition, he's also floating between his seat and the lower equipment bay, and he's taking continuous tracking through the optics onto the lunar module. And he's using this instrument right down here, which is called the sextant. This is a 28 power instrument. And uh, this instrument, the optics are being pointed automatically by the computer, and the vehicle is being automatically maneuvered by the computer. So when Dick goes down there, he looks through this instrument, and the limb should be fairly close to the center of the reticle. If it isn't, he takes the hand controller right about here and he moves it into dead center and then he puts a mark into the computer to update the information for the computer. So he is able to keep exact track of the lunar module. And that's about what Dick is doing, Waller. Good, Leo, and I'm glad that uh, space flight has uh, come uh, really to the point where, where you can go to the moon in your shirt sleeve environment out there in the <laughs> command module, Leo. Uh, we're seeing you in shirt and tie tonight and out of your space flight suit for the first time, I think, since uh, these long uh, history of the Apollo missions. You've been with us on all of them, of course. <laughs> CBS News coverage of Apollo 12's descent to the moon will continue in a moment. This is a message from a paper company about the radial tire. <laughs> If you knew of a machine that stretched all the way from New England down the East Coast, a machine that connected people together East, South, North, and West, wouldn't you say it had to be the most complex machine in the world? Well, there is such a machine, and it's called the Bell Telephone Network. Western Electric people built or provided much of it. You see, Western Electric is the manufacturing and supply unit of the Bell system. We make things your Bell Telephone Company and other Bell Telephone companies across the country need to bring you dependable phone service. So you can call any place you want, anytime you please, and get the one phone you want out of millions and millions of phones. 
and usually for small change. Western Electric. Doesn't our name have a familiar ring? Intrepid uh, right now is just about a thousand miles from its uh, landing site. It just passed over the huge crater Theophilus. Uh, they advised the ground, and Theophilus is just a little bit south of uh, Tranquility Base, where the descent section of the Apollo 11 landing module still rests, where Armstrong and Aldrin walked on the moon uh, in the Apollo 11 flight. They're on their way down toward uh, the point which is called a PDI, the, where they burn their engines again and then for a continual burn to ride that uh, pillar of fire down onto the moon's surface. Hopefully 954 miles uh, due west of uh, where Armstrong and Aldrin walked, uh, they will land this flight on the edge of the ocean of storms, a area which was described to you a moment ago, uh, rather a a uh, flat area for the moon, uh, shallow craters in its immediate vicinity, and one of them of particular interest to, to the men of Apollo 12, and that's the crater in which rests the Surveyor 3, uh, the unmanned lander that's been there for two and a half years and they hope to go to on their second walk tomorrow morning. As they came around the moon, 2,200 miles from their landing site, at a speed of some 3,700 miles, 5,700 miles an hour, here just about 30 minutes ago, they reported that the burn uh, for their descent had been a good, very good burn, and they described their first earth rise, which they had seen coming around on that uh, pass. They said it was absolutely fantastic. They said of the earth, you're about a one-third crescent, and you really are beautiful with blues and whites, Alan Bean reported back to earth. And uh, then he went on to say, boy, this thing sure flies nice. So apparently things are going well in Intrepid for that landing on the moon some 15 minutes from now. Bruce Morton is in Houston with Apollo 8 Commander Frank Borman. And I'm wondering uh, if the nerves have be are beginning to show down there in Houston, Bruce and Frank. Well, I don't know, Walter. Colonel, are you, uh, are you as worried this time as you were last time or as excited? Well, one, uh, one lunar landing isn't what you'd call a lot of data. I think that this is the uh, probably the the most concerning part of the flight. Is it going to be easier this time because uh, it has been done once before and uh, Pete Conrad could talk to Neil Armstrong? Well, uh, certainly that'll add something to the, uh, to make it a little bit easier, but I think it'll be, uh, uh, if it is easier, it'll be because we know that the software is, uh, is properly functioning and the hardware has been tested. The, the crews, uh, in reality, I think, trained pretty much as, uh, as individual teams. What makes the landing the, the trickiest part of the flight? Everybody seems to feel that it is. Well, I think it's the trickiest part because, uh, for one thing, we're landing on a re relatively, uh, I hate to say this and uh, because I know so many people have spent so much time, but it really is not well mapped yet. You're landing in an area that is uh, rough with a lot of slopes, a lot of craters, and you're landing with a very short fuel reserve. What do you think the chances are for this, for this pinpoint landing we've heard about this time? Well, I think they're, uh, they're very good. Uh, I like to kid uh, Walter's sidekick and Pete Conrad by saying I'm a little disturbed because it's an all-Navy crew, but uh, even, even they might be able to luck out. Uh, quite frankly, I think that this crew is probably uh, better trained than uh, perhaps any of the others that have flown. They've had a great deal of experience with the hardware, and I think if anyone can do it, uh, they will. Your flight, uh, of course, was the first to get out there at all. Do you have any uh, any second thoughts about uh, now wanting to go back and walk around on the moon? Some? No, I, I really don't. I, I enjoyed my participation in both the Gemini and the Apollo programs, and I'm uh, I'm very interested and excited with the space station. You think there's a, a little more of a business as usual feeling here this time, uh, less tension? I think there probably is in the city and in the country, but uh, not in the control center. <laughs> Colonel, thank you very much. Welcome. In the control center, the director of uh, NASA, Dr. Thomas Paine, and uh, his deputy, George Miller, and the man who is expected to, uh, uh, or a, one of the deputy, the man space center, George Miller, and the man who is expected to step up into the deputy to Tom Paine, uh, George Lowe, uh, Dr. Werner von Braun, who 
conceived and built this Saturn that's down there, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and uh, Frank Borman, who you saw who had stepped out for a moment to talk with Bruce Morton there at Houston. They're all anxiously waiting for these next few moments and sitting with me here at our CBS News Space Center as he did uh, uh, with, in Apollo 11, uh, my uh, co-pilot. <laughs> Couldn't have a better one, Wally Shira. Uh, and we are waiting now for the firing of the powered descent uh, initiation, the firing of the uh, descent engine, which is throttleable, Wally, from 1,050 to 9,800 pounds of thrust, and they do throttle it and work Just it indeed. down. The computer feed up is telling it what to do down to the point where they go through what they call low gate, which is about 500 feet high, and at that point, uh, Pete Conrad can take control, and he right. will take control and fly it in like a helicopter. If, if necessary, any time. But uh, obviously, we prefer to see an automatic landing because you can take advantage of all the predicted data and let the computer do the hard work. And uh, the next, uh, the, the, the firing of that engine, the beginning of the firing of it, comes just uh, two minutes from now. And we'll be waiting for that. And uh, I don't know whether they're on the circuit right now, uh, whether we're hearing the preparations for that. Uh, punching our control button here, I hear nothing from Houston. The circuit sounds like it's open. Uh, but we will be standing by to, here they go. Houston Radio Loud and Clear. 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 Incidentally, if your eyes were good enough, or you had powerful enough uh, glasses, you might see the lunar module at this moment that is just a little to the left of the center the of the moon. The has gone to the Vox mode in the communications, that is, voice actuated circuit. Be one minute. And we're waiting for All that. Right. One minute. That's his daddy, Pete. Roger, Pete. Seconds. The Intrepid is right now between uh, the areas of the moon called Ptolemus and Fra Mauro. The command module. Okay. Command module is about 150 miles Good behind strike. it. Average speed descent engine is 9. I'm up on velocity light. Got it, nice. A couple of lights, Copy and Intrepid is traveling 3,792 miles an hour. It's altitude 49,423 feet. Nine, eight, we have always seven, six, five, row, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, row. I have a better start. Three, four, Five, descent engine, command override on. Hey, throttle up to 26. Yep. Copy, throttle up. Can't hardly hear you for some reason. Okay. Hit it by for throttle up, Houston. It looks good. Throttle up. Roger, Pete, copy, throttle up. 297 miles from their landing site. Get through, looking good, Pete. All righty, medium looks good. Regulators look good here. Okay, standing by for one minute hack. Okay. Getting a little RCS activity, not too much. All right, one minute. 5208, minus 20, 48,000. Really, looks good. They're right now riding there with their faces Intrepid up. Houston, now six nine in that plus, zero, four, two, zero, zero, over. They cannot see the moon at this point. They're looking up into the dark and black of the sky. Zero. Four, two, zero, zero. That's affirmative. 2169. Enter up at Houston. Go for enter. 
Oakland. Good time, Dave. Hands up at Houston, looking good at two. Roger. These nags are hanging in. Looks good here. Roger, Miss Finn agrees with things and eggs. Yeah, so all three agree. That's great. Very yeah. good, very good. Very good, very good. Those have been the words I wanted to hear. Everything going perfectly. Feels good to be standing up in the G field again. <laughs> Roger. Okay, two minutes and 30 seconds. 4276 minus 53 and 44,700. Looks good. Put smoking right down there. Look at RCS. Looks good, Pete. They're now, they're now moving about 2,500 miles an hour. We've been giving the ED bats today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, don't forget the ED bats today. What's that? There you go. Three minutes. About 44 feet per second fast. About six feet per second low on H side and about 100 feet low on altitude. Looking good. Intrepid Houston, Roger, you're looking good at three. Okay, Houston. I have an altitude light out and a velocity light out. Roger. What does that mean, Why? Means they're right on. They're, I'm they're showing right at the minus 918, yeah. minus 1,000. Looks good. How's it look to you, Houston? Well, there was a light Roger. stream on. They'd read out an error. Right, velocity just, just and, to uh, show them that they're yeah. well within the, the spectrum that they should be flying. Right no there. sooner said than done. Yeah. Let me know when it converges. I'm going back to my normal displays. Okay, Pete. We're within 100 miles now. Hands up at Houston here. Go at four and go past go. five. Houston. Roger, copy, ED, bath, go. Back here, here comes. We're now down to around 2,000 miles an hour. 2,000 miles an hour. They've slowed down to that. Rather interesting. Isn't it? They got EV bats as the descent stage batteries, and they want to have those okay. on. Okay. Hulk overall again. Hulk out everything. RCS looks good. Electrics look good. Pressure pressure CO2 is as usual zero. <laughs> got a couple of good winners in these two space days. Okay, we're out of 35,000. Roger, Pete. Yeah, I get a fair amount of getting a fair amount of RCS firing more than I think I should. But uh, how's the gimbal what you guys using? They're looking good, Pete. Okay. There's a five-minute hack, Al. Okay. The RCS firing is the little firing that the thrusters to adjust attitude, right? Right. Uh, no, most of it's adjusted by the descent engine, but uh, little errors are, uh, accumulate, and then these these are taken out as you saw in the simulation there. Uh, yeah. Now the center of gravity is off a little bit because of this tremendous amount of fuel that's been burned, so there's more activity from this. Houston, throttle down at six plus two two. We got her six plus two two. two, two. Just gave you a little ags update. Good. We'll see how well this here computer is right on the money. Better turn that sequence camera on in a moment. Okay. Let's see how well that computer is really doing and bringing them in this time. With uh, okay. more updates than they got in Apollo 11, they're hoping yeah. to wipe out that four-mile error. I don't have that uh, radar involved this time, which overloaded it last time, if you recall. I'm sure we all recall. <laughs> okay, standard by for throttle down. Twenty-three. Let's give it another update. Donald Donald six plus two three. Roger. Right on the scheduled time. Zero. Four zero. They, they were operating on almost the full right. power of that descent engine of the nine thousand pounds of thrust, and now they're down to sixty percent of Four. that, or around uh, six thousand, roughly, times the thrust. Mm -hmm. 
baby has really given it the kazoozy with the RCS, isn't it? <laughs> there is. Why don't I go ahead and put the camera on you? All right, why don't you? Run it. This is a new minute. word in case you haven't heard that. <laughs> the, this conversation you're hearing is, uh, of course, to use some, but also between Pete Conrad and Alan Bean. Okay, Pete, seven minutes. One, one, five, three. Means you're about 36 per second. Uh, wait a minute, let's... Yeah, that's right. Let's go ahead and go for 730. Okay, we're out of 19,000 feet. I got some kind of a horizon out there. I got some craters, too, but I don't know where I am yet. 730. The smoke over the numbers is so okay, 1130, 1153, up to bed. And it's 135, it's descending a little faster than normal. And we're a little bit low. Full luck. 160 feet a second, huh? Okay. 23. We'll be there in a minute. Number. Hammer's running. They should be pitching up now. They're about 67 degrees from the vertical now, and then surely they'll be up to about 59 degrees, and then they should be able to see the horizon. Then they'll begin to... 12,000 feet. Orange right tape needle, Houston. Roger. Spring loaded to go grab that shirt. Roger, you're out of 10,000 feet. Hook up your lanyard. Okay. And <laughs> a buy for P64. Okay. I'm trying to cheat and look out there. I think I see my crater. Hey, right, baby. I'm okay. not sure. Coming through seven. Look at P64, P. P64. That's it, there's LPD. Roger, copy, P-64. Hey, there it is. There it is. Son of a gun, right down the middle of the road. Outstanding, oh, 43 yes. degrees, Pete. Hey, it's starting right from 42. the center of the crater. Hey, look out there. I can't believe it. Amazing. <laughs> Fantastic. 42 degrees, dude. Just keep talking. Glide it in. 42, we're passing 3,500. Coming down at about 99 feet a second. You're looking good. Got 15% fuel. I'll reset my watch. Traffic okay. Houston, going for landing. Over one. I just want LPD to the right a little. Okay, Roger. 40 degrees, LPD. 40 That's degrees. so fantastic, I can't believe it. You're at 2,000 feet. How far? The boys on the ground do okay. 1,800 feet up, 39 degrees. You got 94 seconds. LPD time right? Okay, I'll move forward a little bit. 38. 38 degrees, 36 degrees. You're 1,200 feet, Pete. Okay, 1,000 feet coming down at 30. You're looking good. Got 14% fuel. Looks good out there, Dave. Looks good. 32 degrees. You're at 800 feet. 33 degrees. It's 680 feet. 33 degrees. 600 feet. Antenna's okay. Okay. 35 degrees. 530 feet. 530. 471. You are all right. 426. I got it. 400. With G66, Pete. Right. G66. Okay. Yeah, I got to get over here. 330 right. feet coming down at 4. Got 11%. Got loads again. 300 feet coming down at 5. Nice hey, look at that crater right where it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. You're beautiful. 10%. 257 feet coming down at 5. 240 coming down at 5. Hey, you're really maneuvering around. Yeah. Come on down, Pete. Okay. 10% fuel. 200 feet coming down at 3. You need to come on down. Okay. 190 feet. Come on down. 180 feet. 9%. You're looking good. Going to get some dust before long. 130 feet, 124 feet, Pete. 120 feet coming down at 6. You got 9%. 8%. You're looking okay. 96 feet coming down at 6. Slow down the descent rate. 80 feet, 80 feet coming down at 4. You're looking good. 70 feet. Looking real good. 63 feet. 60 feet coming down at 3. 50 feet coming down. Watch for the dust. Now, 46. Low level. 42 feet, coming down at 3. Coming down at 2, okay. Start the clock. 42 feet, coming down at 2. 40 coming down at 2. Looking good, watch the left. 31, 32, 30 feet. Coming down at 2, feet. you got plenty of gas, plenty of gas, dude. 
Hang in there. 30 seconds. 18 feet. Coming down at two. He's got it made. Come on in there. <laughs> 24 feet. Contact light. Roger. Copy contact. Drop. Ah, ah. that beautiful blue light? Oh, great. Okay. It's storm off. Okay. I'll cycle you fast. You got your suspension command override off. Yep. Okay, that's the off cycle the main shut off now. Okay. Start speed closed. You get both brakes closed, Dave. The brakes are closed. Good landing. Pete, outstanding. Man, answer our on. Beautiful. He's got set. Fire. Okay, I'll smoke over the acid. Ah, the acid helium looks okay. How about that, huh? Okay, descent rag warning light. Don't worry about it. Acid extendables look good. O2H2O. The book turned over. Okay, we're in hot shape, Houston. We're in real good shape. Roger, Pete. Engine stop, you pushed it. Yep, bro. Both control both auto. Both auto. Descent engine command override right off. Off. Engine arm off. Off. I got the 413 in and cycle the partner valve. Okay. Structure ISO valves are done. Main shutoff's done. You've been it. Master arm on. Master arm, you turned it off. Going Master down that checklist. Off. Okay. Post landing checklist. Okay. And then the next thing is the preparation so they could get off again if they had to. I, I think we're in a place that's a lot dustier than Neil's. The good thing we had a simulator because that was an IFR landing. Mm -hmm. Roger, baby. I was high, Al. Yeah, I know it. Holy crap, it's beautiful out here. It sure is. It's something else. We flew by. Hello, 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 How are you? Hey, That's Gordon calling him, I guess. Yeah. Thank you, sir. It's really good. Hey, I'll turn it on. IFR, meaning an instrument approach, meaning uh, no visibility. That's it. They apparently had a real cloud of dust. But what an exciting approach and what an excited crew as they found themselves going right down the road, as he said, right where they wanted to be. Great. That's That's a testimonial to improved data from uh, one flight to the next. And what an important thing this is for future flights, because this is the flight that was to prove out pinpoint landing. Houston, but this ground looks neat out here. We're not going to have any trouble going back there. Roger. Okay, we're lunar line. Houston, where you at? Where'd you put her down, Pete? Yeah, Over on uh, site four? Uh, no, sir. About uh, halfway between site four and site three. I, I, I uh, flew by the right side of the crater and then had to fly over to the left and land. We're in good shape. Roger. Please get your engine stopped, Pete. Okay. You guys did outstanding fighting, Pete. I'm telling you, that thing was right down the middle. Beautiful. Oh, we're glad to hear that, Pete. Yeah. Intrepid Houston, we got you now 43. Okay. Roger. Bro, going to Pete. Okay. One, two, enter. We've never had a more exciting demonstration either okay. of, the, uh, of the teamwork of a pair of pilots flying in the way that the, the, these fellows were. And, and all of you do, of course, Wally, but we've never really been tuned in quite so completely to that readout. Uh, Alan Bean reading Pete Conrad right in. Pete is busy controlling, watching out the window for that control, watching his control. Okay. Alan Bean reading out okay. his, the fuel okay. residuals and so forth. It was, it was marvelous. Okay. Well, it's kind of fun to share that. Uh, the voice relay, of course, they don't have to press buttons to talk to us, so they can just continually talk, and we had the privilege of listening in. Here are guys landing 230,000 miles away on the moon, and we're listening to them as if we were sitting there in a third seat in the cockpit. Right there, right on your car here. I'll read it to you. Okay. Five, five, These are one, simulations, five, of course. Five. And right. later this yeah. morning, six o'clock, they're going to climb out of this lunar module, and then we're going to see, we hope we see, if all works well, color pictures from the moon surface for the first time when the color television cameras are deployed. 
from that lunar module. Houston, how does the ag look? Intrepid Houston, things and ag both looking great. Okay. We'll let him push one in there. Ben, I can't wait to get outside. Look at that. <laughs> they, uh, they don't have a rest period scheduled Pretty here fair. between now and their walk. It's going to take them the nearly the four hours from now to walk time to get ready. Okay, it's quite an intricate process to uh, check out everything. Of course, they're really taking another spaceship, putting it on them as a portable uh, vehicle which we call our space suits, or some people do. It's a nice place Back to land. Back. Well, it sure was dusty, though. And sorry, I flew by, but that was just going too fast. Nice touch, Darren. Felt like you just a little bit on the back. The good thing we leveled off high yeah. and came down, because I sure couldn't see what was underneath us once I uh, got into that dust. That's a long way. That's going to the horizon. Did you really? Just like you said. Look at those boulders out there on the horizon. Gee, my dear. This is a pretty good place. Right over there. Yeah. Those are right. Are we over the Cook? Are we on 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 Oh, great. Okay. And we'll get it up. Okay, Houston, are we go or stay? Intrepid Houston, uh, you're staying. If you'd like to okay, recycle right. and try it again, we'll uh, talk to Sim. <laughs> <laughs> no, not this time. Yeah, we're still yeah. headed in. You understand what that was about. Week. But 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 share it with the, the yeah. folks. Of course, they, they were saying go or stay, and uh, Houston was saying if you'd like to practice it all over again, you're welcome to go ahead, or you'd better stay if you'd like. <laughs> In other words, instead of climbing out of the simulator and going home for the day, while well, they'd recycle the feed into the simulator, and you can play with it once play more. Play one much right? more. That's it. <laughs> they get about oh, uh, I guess about ten lunar landings a day in the simulator, <laughs> but only one in the real world. This, uh, mm -hmm. this certainly has been, well, uh, maybe with the exception of you and your crew, is uh, the most enthusiastic trio I think we've sent into space. And these two fellows now uh, down there in the in the Intrepid, uh, you know, the enthusiasm all the way in on this this thing it was like a couple of kids in a new ride at the, at the amusement park. I wish. People will let us talk that way, frankly. That's what it is. It's a new ride in the amusement park. It's a world park in this case, but there's no reason to be stuffy about the fact that this is a rather delightful phenomena to fly a little vehicle like this and make it and go where it's supposed to. The holding fine and the venting is going along well. Okay, I'll tell you what, we're going to start hustling along here, so uh, I'd appreciate it if uh, uh, you give me a holler when it gets down into the two to eight range. Will do it, Pete. Uh, they've got a pretty tight uh, timeline now for the next uh, four hours. Uh, it, uh, they've got a couple of hours of uh, really working with the spaceship itself. Uh, Roger, Dick, uh, can you get the high gain pointed at us? We'd like to dump that tape recorder. Uh, checking out the... Uh, checking out how the landing went, the, the systems on the landing, and then preparing for the takeoff. They do that now uh, to be sure that they are ready to go if anything demands that they get off the moon's surface. If any uh, goblins come out of the craters around by, anything of that sort. And, uh, and then they start preparing for the walk, and that takes a good two hours. So they've got, uh, they've got a while. Uh,
pretty tough work here before they step out, and I think at 6.09 a.m. is the scheduled uh, actual departure. They could make it, I suppose, a few minutes before that. There's no real uh, restriction on, on that time if they got all ready to go and wanted to go a little bit early. No, there's I no special could... connection they're trying to make here. They have a round-trip guarantee. <laughs> <laughs> we hope they've got a round-trip <laughs> yes. guaranteed. Arthur Clark is with us again on the flight of Apollo 12 as he was with us on Apollo 11. We're so glad to see the author of 2001 and so many other great bits of science fiction back with us after his sojourn in his home in Ceylon. Not many of us can say that, that we ran home to Ceylon between flights. Arthur can. Arthur, I suppose if you had a spaceship, you'd, uh, you could make it a little faster to Ceylon. <laughs> yes, I was at the Air Force Museum the other day, and I saw the XB-17, you know, the 2,000-mile-an-hour bomber, and I got a photograph of myself standing under it, and I sent it to my friend saying, this is the second on the airplane I'm buying, so I can get home quickly. <laughs> oh. Arthur. Arthur, Arthur, what are you expecting uh, out of uh, this flight? Are, are, you, are you beginning to get blasé about going to the moon, are you anxious to move on to other planets? No, I don't think I shall get blasé about going to the moon until I've gone myself the second time. The but second time. Uh -huh. you're, you're, you're in line for two trips to the moon. So yes, after, the, after that I may become a bit blasé. But of course we want to make this a standard thing so that it'll be eventually no more exciting than flying the Atlantic. I mean, 30 years ago the whole world was watching when one man was flying the Atlantic and now how many thousands of people are doing it? Well, one day I think there'll be thousands of people in space, maybe one day millions. It's just 42 years since that first man flew the yeah. Atlantic. 42 years from now puts us into certainly the 21st century, but uh, not very far in. It's not that far away. Exactly. Is it? Except for some of us, perhaps. Is it, I, had my, <laughs> I flew my first airplane this afternoon. You, you chartered a plane to get me here to the studio, and the pilot was foolish enough to offer me the controls, so I took over. So I can say for the first time in my life, I've flown an airplane today. <laughs> I got it. There's a little stick and rudder man here. <laughs> <laughs> CBS News color coverage. A man's second landing on the moon will continue in a moment. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4. Holding momentarily. APO switch to proceed. Proceed. 3, 2, 1, 0. Trees, grown by the International Paper Company, will help carry man into space. For we now know that nature in growing trees creates a substance ideal for spacecraft, stronger, lighter than metal. Another substance made from our trees can absorb up to 5,000 degrees of heat to protect metal, instruments, or men sheltered behind it. Trees have been sheltering men for millions of years. It's a never-ending story. The International Paper Company, where good ideas grow on trees. CBS News color coverage of the flight of Apollo 12 continues after station identification. This is CBS.
CBS News color coverage. Return to the moon. The flight of Apollo 12. This morning, walk on the moon by astronauts Conrad and Bean. Sponsored by the International Paper Company, where good ideas grow on trees. And by Western Electric, the people who make telephones and communications equipment for the Bell System. Reporting from the CBS News Space Center in New York, correspondent Walter Cronkite. Well, Intrepid, uh, with its precious cargo of Commander uh, Conrad and Commander Beam, is on the moon. A beautiful landing, apparently. A very uh, enthusiastic crew reported that they went right down the road to where they wanted to go and landed on the edge of the ocean of storms. They did uh, the computer uh, feeding into the spacecraft uh, that was aiding that landing uh, did uh, uh, force the use of a little more fuel than they had intended. They hovered a little bit longer perhaps than had been planned. It was hoped that they might have as much as two minutes of fuel uh, left when they landed. It turned out they had about 55 seconds of uh, propellants left. And since they always leave a bank of 30 seconds of propellants there, they had 25 seconds before they would have had to abort the mission, that is, to go back up and uh, to begin the process of rejoining the command module. That's uh, a little bit better, though, even so, than Apollo 11, which had uh, just 40 seconds of propellant left or 10 seconds before an abort would have been necessary in that uh, landing of uh, Armstrong and Aldrin. But now they are on the moon, and Conrad and Bean are preparing their spacecraft and themselves for their walk on the moon, which will come at uh, another four hours from now. Exactly where they landed on the moon, well, David Schumacher and Dr. John Salisbury can show us where the LAM landed on our lunar module over here, gentlemen. Walter, while uh, you were busy landing on the moon, we were busy painting pointers. We have our pointer painted. And Dr. Salisbury, why don't you give us uh, your best guess? Well, we, were, we did have our model here in this area and have moved it over to the left uh, based on what we could hear uh, of the astronaut uh, conversation, which said that they moved from the left side to the right, as I heard it. And this uh, appeared to be that because of uh, obstructions of landing, I assume boulders on the right-hand side. They later mentioned boulders on the horizon. It was very nice of you not to say, I told you so. Oh, no. Well, but you didn't was... tell us about the dust. What, did, what was that all about? There no. was a lot more, apparently, than on 11. Uh, I uh, can't uh, testify to, uh, to, to, uh, to 11 very well, but uh, I, I expected dust here, not necessarily more. But we did have the experience of Surveyor 3, which uh, for, didn't quite turn its engines off before it landed, hopped a few times as a result. But it had its mirror, the camera mirror, covered with uh, dust, uh, which interfered with the picture taking considerably. Uh, I didn't realize that this meant there was more dust here, but it certainly did have a dust problem. Could we look at this uh, other uh, model just of the crater area? It shows uh, a scale there of about 600 feet, and uh, you can point out the surveyor. I think it's in the shadow, just as it is to the astronauts right now. Uh, and where do you think we are there compared to the, the surveyor? Sur yeah, the surveyor is there. I would assume they've landed over here on this rim. Now that looks uh, pretty steep uh, going down that way. That's more than that 12 uh, to 14 degree incline that they were thinking about. Uh, would they come around to the front, do you think? To oh, I, I think they'd traverse across the front of the crater, yes. That is, traverse across this part, which would, it, would not involve a, much of a downslope at all. It's quite a gentle slope, despite the appearance. Walter? That crater is uh, 660 feet across, is it, gentlemen, and about 50 to 60 feet deep. The uh, uh, they mentioned uh, at one point that they, uh, uh, Conrad mentioned that he had flown over the crater, at least I think I understood him to say that, uh, presumably uh, meaning that crater as he moved there from the right side landing spot to the left side landing spot. Uh, would that, would that uh, with all the dust he was raising, create any problem with the uh, surveyor, do you think, uh, covering it with uh, dust that might... Uh, might ruin some of the experiments. I know they had hoped to bring back pieces of the surveyor because it was going to have been untouched in the two and a half years since it landed. They'd be able to see just what kind of erosion takes place on the moon. Now it'll be covered with dust. Will they be able to tell as much? 
Do you think, Dr. Uh, well, I assume that, uh, that they will not. After all, they, they did want to find out how much dust had got into it and onto it, and this will change things. Walter, we're still uh, trying to get a replay on those tapes to be just sure whether they flew across the top of the crater or around the edge. Uh, we've, we've heard both versions. Right. We really don't know yet. Uh, we've, we're tuned into Houston, and we're uh, waiting to hear more from the men in Intrepid as to exactly where they landed. Uh, all we've been able to do so far is speculate on that exact landing uh, spot. And there are going to be a lot of space buffs in uh, Houston, uh, New York, and elsewhere who are going to try to measure that distance exactly from the surveyor to pay off on a few pools. Uh, the uh, the uh, time of landing was just given a moment ago. I, I've got one ear cocked here for, uh, for any word from Intrepid, and uh, that's why I, I seem to be bemused occasionally <laughs> listening into the transmissions to give you any late information we get. Uh, we're told that uh, the unofficial landing time, uh, as reported from Houston, is 1.5435, uh, that is uh, 54 minutes and 35 seconds after 1 a.m., and the landing time as scheduled in the original flight plan as they took off was one hour, uh, was 1.53.18 for their landing. So as you see, uh, they uh, came within one minute and 17 seconds of the uh, scheduled landing time that was made before they left Earth uh, four days, 230,000 miles ago. Quite a remarkable feat. Nelson Benton and Scott McLeod and Grumman. I'm wondering uh, uh, if you gentlemen had really anticipated they were going to get that close to their aiming point. Walter, it seems that uh, whether you're in a Piper Cub or a Lem, the landing is still the most exciting part of all. I hadn't anticipated, though, it would be that accurate. Scott, uh, had you anticipated that? Oh, I was sure it would be. I was very confident in the crew. Well, you know, on Apollo 11, we heard uh, all that conversation of program alarms, there were lights on the, on the board when they were going in. This time, the, the landing seemed to be just, uh, well, it was right down the pike. It was absolutely normal. Has the equipment been changed, or were the procedures changed? Well, basically just the procedures have been changed to eliminate the program alarms that they had last time. And we heard uh, during the uh, descent that they were doing uh, quite a bit of eyeball correcting as they got yes. closer to the closer to the earth. Uh, Leo Krupp in the uh, command module simulator, how do you react to that on the button landing? Well, Nelson, that landing was, was pro probably the best that anyone could anticipate or, or expect. Uh, Pete really drove it right in there, and uh, Al Bean was really working with him as a team, and uh, I feel sure that they gained a lot of very valuable uh, experience and a lot of valuable tips from, from Neil Armstrong and, and Buzz Aldrin, and uh, they really put it to good work because they worked well as a team and they really drove it right in there. Looking forward to uh, about an hour and a half from now when they come around on their next pass because as you remember, uh, Mike Collins had trouble tracking the lunar module after it landed on the lunar surface. As a result, we never were really quite sure exactly where the LEM landed. Now, on the next pass around about an hour and a half from now, the lunar module will track the the uh, command module using its rendezvous radar and will we'll work a reverse solution to send that back up to the command module to help point the optics on the pass after that so uh, Dick Gordon will be able to point his optics and we hope he'll be able to pick up the LEM using the, uh, the sextant. Uh, this is a 28 power uh, scope but it only has a 1.8 degree field of view so it's sort of looking like looking through a keyhole uh, for a needle in a haystack, so he has to have very accurate pointing accuracy to do that, and we hope that on this flight he will be able to track the LEM on the lunar surface. Thank you, Leo. Uh, let's uh, listen again to uh, Mission Control, and they've been uh, piping through the voices of the men in Intrepid. Uh, we just got a... Boulder is an aircraft landing on a carrier that misses the arresting wire and has to go around again. I think they're inferring by that, Walter, that there was a case of uh, not landing exactly where they wanted to, and uh, if you do that, uh, the carrier, the bolter turn means that you uh, missed the wire. You have airspeed sufficient to go off the carrier deck and make another landing pass. In this case, you don't have that. Yeah. Mission Control said that it was a typical Navy landing, 
Oh, that means very good. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you, Navy <laughs> Captain Shira. All three of these men, you know, on the flight of Apollo 12 are commanders in the Navy. Official touchdown time of Intrepid, 110 hours, 32 minutes, 29 seconds. This was the time the blue touchdown light, lunar contact light in the limb cabin came on. And from first indications, the landing point is about 350 meters due west of where Surveyor is located in the uh, east wall of the crater. 350 meters computes out to about uh, 1,120 feet. We've had loss of signal with 